Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. It has been a little bit since my last episode. There has been a lot going on. Um, as you know, my, uh, my husband and I moved to Portugal. I mentioned that in the last episode, but then since I recorded that episode, I flew back to the States. My father um, was ill and... He actually died this past Saturday, so I am incredibly grateful that I was able to come home for that and be here um, in time to not only spend some time with him before he passed, but uh, to be with here, be with him when it happened. It's not easy, but it, um, it is something that I will always be grateful for. But um, you know, we're. We're doing okay, and we're here to talk about uh, a book and an author interview, and I'm happy to be doing that because, uh, as you know, I love talking to authors and getting to know them and learning about their books and why they write books and their favorite things about writing books, etc., and I am happy to be able to continue to do that and bring you this author interview. I'm speaking today with author Eva Shaw. I mentioned that at the end of the last episode, and we are once again in historical fiction, this time in New Orleans, World War II. Let me give you the description of the book. It's February 1942. War grips the world. Asian hate runs rampant, and New Orleans is a dangerous place for Chinese-English scientist Thomas Ling as he collides with self-proclaimed psychic Beatrix Patterson. She's a good liar with an excellent memory, which, in truth, is her only gift. Well, that and conning the well-heeled out of their money and secrets. Hired by the U.S. Army to use her connections to expose Nazi saboteurs and sympathizers, Beatrix recruits the reluctant Thomas. Together they pit their skills against a government conspiracy, terrorist cells, kidnappings, and murderous plots. As Beatrix grapples with the truth of her own past, she must come to terms with her ruse. Exposing the Nazi war machine about to invade the country could cost Beatrix everything she's worked so hard to build. But the information she and Thomas uncover could change the outcome of the war. The question remains, will anyone believe a liar and a suspected traitor? So that is, again, the description of, did I even give you the name of the book? I don't think I did. The name of the book is The Seer. <laughs> and that is the description of The, of the Seer um, by Eva Shaw. It is a historical mystery. I was fascinated by a lot of parts of this book because while I as you know, I'm um, a fan of historical fiction, and I particularly like historical fiction set during the time of World War II. I had no idea that Camp Algiers existed in New Orleans. Um, and if I did, I mean, I might have a, a tiny memory of that somewhere in my brain, but I didn't realize that Nazi prisoners were housed alongside of um, interred Jewish um, well, I mean, they were basically prisoners. And I just can't imagine that the horror that that must have been for the Jewish prisoners in that camp at that time. And so I was fascinated to learn more about that. And um, just a time in New Orleans that maybe we don't often think about. Well, there's a lot of history, of course, in New Orleans, but maybe we don't um readily think about World War II as, as the, the time period for New Orleans historical fiction. So I'm really glad that Eva wrote about this time period because I got to learn something new, which I always love. And um, just a time period in a city that I've been to, but hadn't really thought too much about its significance during the war and, and 
the the fear that people had that um, that the Germans were going to invade, that they were going to come up the river and invade New Orleans after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So some some things for me to think about and look into in terms of history and research and finding out more. Uh, this has whetted my appetite for that. So thank you, Eva, for that. Um, this. <laughs> I'm so happy Eva's a patient and um, patient person with a sense of humor because it was a comedy of errors. I'll just tell you, if the second half of the interview sounds as though we had a whole bunch of conversation beforehand, we did. Um, we were having technical issues. I'm at my parents' house in Montana. The internet was not great that day. We lost the signal. And when we reconnected on Zoom, I did not hit record. So we did the second half of the interview twice. <laughs> Thank you to Eva for being so patient and willing to do the second half a second time because, oh my goodness, we got through it. And um, now you can you can enjoy it and just know that, yes, we do sound as though we've had this conversation before because we have. Let's go ahead and turn now to the interview. Again, the book is The Seer and the author is Eva Shaw. Hi, Eva. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. Delighted to be here. I am happy to have you. We're going to talk about your historical fiction mystery. It's called The Seer. But before we do that, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you, that would be wonderful. Oh, that's great. Let's see. I know I'm a little known fact. I am learning on my bucket list. We all have pandemic bucket lists these days. I wanted to learn a stringed instrument and ever been musical and quite frankly I don't think I am but I've been learning the banjo lele which is like a ukulele and a banjo and so much fun so um I have been I've been writing since I was years old (laughs) and always wanted to be a writer when I grew up and in my these I reached a point where I got tired of telling people I wanted to be a writer when I was growing up and to shut up and do it. And uh, that was, oh, and I've never looked back. I love to write. And I I have to pinch myself, in, not very hard, however, and uh, that people actually buy me, pay me. I am also a ghost writer, Sarah, so I don't, and I also teach. I wear a lot of hats in the writing world which is good because I am one of those people that sees a shiny eye and runs after it, I think. And The Seer um, is my latest mystery. And it was so fun to write and research at every minute. And I even enjoy reading it now as if I was a reader and not the author. Oh, fun. That sounds great. Um, you said banjo lele. I'd never actually heard banjo, of that, but it makes perfect yeah. sense. Like a banjo and a ukulele had a baby. It, exactly. I have a friend said it looks just like what Kermit played in the swamp. Oh, perfect. So, <laughs> maybe, maybe he did. I don't know. Yeah. And it's been around since the early 1900s. And um, it has kind of a honky tonk more than an ukulele. Ukulele is how Hawaiians say that word. Yeah. And the rest of it, um, and it's uh it has plastic string. Hmm. So I didn't have to get really tough fingers to learn it, which was yeah. And it's a it's a lot of fun. I wanted to do something to stretch my brain out of my wheelhouse. And I also I love to paint canvases, not houses. Love to garden and read, and my little dog Coco Rose, a Welsh Terrier, she and I just hike and walk everywhere we possibly can. So music was creative, structured, and I've learned to read music, and I'm learning the finer techniques of it. Of course, I'm taking love, which helps. Yes, wonderful. What what does Coco Rose think of um, the the banjo lele? Is she a fan? Is she not? <laughs> Well, she's not as bad as Andy's dog, who he picks up his ukulele and poor Sam, this lab, runs out. Of- oh, no, no. Coco will tolerate it for the longest time and then she'll jump and paw my music or want to sit on my lap. And then I figure, well, I've been practicing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it 
it's time to move on, apparently. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. And I don't know, but you know, a, a, a banjo lele player may show up for all I know. <laughs> you never know. Um, yeah. Well, let's talk about the book. Again, it's called The Seer. It's historical fiction, uh, New Orleans during World War II. So can you give a, an overview of the story? Sure. It is about uh, Beatrix Patterson. It's called The Seer. And Beatrix Patterson is a fake psychic. She knows she's a fake psychic. But she's in New Orleans right after uh, the bombing on Pearl Harbor when there was so much... And uh, America was not ready to enter a war financially or in any way. So because Beatrix is an excellent reader of people, she becomes a psychic as a way to earn money and to locate her past. Federal government hi hires her to uh, flesh out not terrorists and homegrown terrorists and things that were happening in New Orleans because New Orleans hub of industry at that time, a hub of transportation. And I've based uh, the research, of course, on facts and then weaved in my character. But it's true that um, the Nazis were attempting to overtake South America and especially cripple the Panama Canal. And if the Panama Canal crippled, America might have been done for. So it's in reality, and I have always been a student of history. I just love it. And it's like, okay, it's like gossiping about people that um, make their mark <laughs> and talk about them. And why did they do this? Why did that happen? And come up with all the conjectures. And so that's why Beatrix is in and she gets mixed up in kidnapping and attempted murder and terrorists and uh, spousal abuse and my goodness. And at the end, and I won't, it's not a spoiler, but there is a moral question as how I end the book. And a British friend, uh, Susan, was a little uncomfortable. And uh, at the end, she felt that somebody should be far more punished than they would be. I thought that was interesting. It's time for the first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll find out if Eva saw the ending coming or if it was a surprise to her as well. <laughs> Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Eva Shaw. We are talking about her historical mystery, The Seer. Let's go ahead and return now to that interview. Yeah. And did she, um, so as you were writing, uh, you know, did, did you foresee that, that ending or did Beatrix kind of surprise you with how she reacted to situations? That's a really good question. Sometimes these characters do get away with telling how to run the story and it does sound psychotic. I was giving a program, I, I do a lot of workshops, especially pre-pandemic, and um, I was to this big group of people about writing, and I said, sometimes, you know, I, I talk to my character, what they want to be written, and how things should end, and so on, and afterward, a psychiatrist came up to me, and he said, you know, honey, if you hear voices, you should get professional help. <laughs> He wasn't yeah. really a writer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 
know, I, um, I was going to uh, hand out the pin, but it just didn't feel right. So um, I'm glad Beatrix stuck up first. Yeah, and um, you talk a little bit about this at, in the beginning of the book before the story starts, but um, talk a little bit about your inspiration for the story and Eva as the um, character. I have always loved New Orleans, and for the last 20 years, I've been, because I've had uh, writing clients there for my ghostwriting, going back and forth, and um, with each visit, I learn a little bit more, or who live there show me things and tell me the history. The history is rich for characters, and um, frankly, it is, I think it's against Bad meal in New Orleans. I just, it is, it's one of that reminds me of an older aunt that you know you're going to visit and you know you're going to get in trouble because she wears too much rouge, too much perfume, and you cannot wait to visit her. And I feel that close to New Orleans. So my many trips, because I love history, I made sure I went to museums and saw thought out local places. And all that time, apparently 20 years of searching, I just knew I had to feature uh, my next mystery to Orleans with my love for the city as I have. So I dug even more at places like Camp Algiers, which is across the river, locally they call it the river, across the river from New Orleans, where there was a P.O. truly, and you can still go there and see relics of it. But at one time, our government, who often makes social, we say, um, had, uh, had gone into South America and rounded up anyone that they thought was speaking German. And of course, a lot of German Jews to South America fearing for their life, and rightly so, um, for the not, And so they brought these supposed Nazis to a POW camp and had them with actual not Nazis. These were women and children and who just wanted to start a new life. And so that was very true. And when I read that, the area, I just knew I had to include it in the book. Yeah, I think it's fascinating because I didn't know a lot about that before I started reading the book. And now I, I want to know more. I mean, I, I think most people are familiar with the internment camps that we had maybe on the West Coast. Um, yeah. I mentioned before we started talking that I grew up in Montana and there was an internment camp in in Montana, in Missoula, that um, yeah. I don't think a lot of people know about either. So they were they were a lot more. Unfortunately, there were a lot more than I think people realize. I think so, too. And I think that's the beauty of uh, historical fiction is you can help share information that uh, might not normally be known. And I certainly didn't know about these POW in um, outside of the city of New Orleans. Right. And like you, I knew because I'm in California, I knew about the internment camps here, but uh, not other places fascinated me. Yeah, and I agree. That's that's a wonderful thing about historical fiction is that it can it can whet your interest for something that you might not have known about, and then you can you know start doing looking into it further if there's something mm -hmm. that interests you. Um, how about uh, Beatrix herself? Can you talk about what about her as the main character might resonate with readers? Well, I think because she's vulnerable and she is a liar, and she knows she's a liar, by by lying. Um, I have a, a master's in psychology, so everybody's safe. But why do people lie? And for what? Lie? And she knows she's lying. But like that old TV show, the, the what was that show? Um, the one he was a he was a fan in the show. And um, so she's able to read people and then come to conclusions. And she also helps people. She considers herself the uh, Robin Hood of fake psychics. 
because uh, she takes from they pay her. And then she's also helping the French war resistance. And uh, because this is, you know, we were fighting on both areas um, uh, in Africa and throughout Europe. And so because she has French ties in the French resistance and she's very motivated, she's vulnerable, she's been hurt a lot, but she just keeps bouncing back. And I think that's one of the things perhaps I've uh, <laughs> included in my personality because I've had some hard times throughout my life and I am extremely resilient and Beatrix too and I'm hoping that the reader will cheer for her at the end. And you you talked a little bit about the research earlier but I I can just I can only imagine that it would it must have been hard to stop like to find a place to stop researching and start writing the book. Oh. How how was that process for you? That that you know that's that's a kind of a gut into issue. And I'm, I'm asked that a lot. A great question, Sarah. Um, because you didn't know enough that you can write about it, but you don't want to spend your blooming life um, uh, researching the quality of the river walk in uh, New Orleans in 1942. You just know that it was muddy. Uh, and I find that as I'm writing, if I'm failing, if I start just, like I say, yammering on with my writing, no, I have not researched enough. So then I go back to the research process and dig a more and, um, you know, keep my backside to my chair and looking on the computer. And then when I feel that comfort level restore, I'm able to continue writing. But it's it's a fine line. You can get a hole and you're gone. Oh, yeah. I'm just thinking that, you know, it, you don't need to know about the water quality. But I could find myself like randomly reading and then thinking, why am I still reading about this? Like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And um, um, also trustworthy sites going to pop uh, pop culture sites, uh, Wikipedia, find trustworthy ones. And if there's something suspicious in researching, and you know, there's something re- uh, suspicious, uh, check it out. Uh, don't, sorry, but leave everything on the internet. <laughs> well, right. And, or uh, if, if you want, if it's something that you're fascinated by and you want to use it, double check. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes you have to triple check some weird thing. Yeah. That's how I found out about Camp Algiers. I didn't realize that at that time allowed Nazis to uh, have the uh, swastika flying above this POW camp. Yeah, yeah, I was horrified by that. And so I knew I had to include it. Absolutely. Um how about character development? So when you start writing, do you have a pretty good picture in your head about each character or does that develop as you write them or is it a combination thereof? A combination thereof. Um, I told me that she thought I was most like uh, Beatrix male counterpart, Thomas Ling. He's a Chinese um, uh, British scientist. And dear Tom, he just... Uh, he's very methodical as a scientist, but he just goes crazy times with his emotions. And I love that part. But the, the characters have a tendency to write themselves, become fuller as I, be, as I know them more. And uh, yes, I do talk to them. I hear their stories in my head. Um, and it's a wonderful creative part of writing. And I, I think most fiction writers, if be honest, will say that they, yeah, they do talk to their characters and, and the characters uh, can take over the book in a good way. Yeah, I've, I've heard other authors talk about that as well. I should have taken a break between thoughts because I did not leave myself a good editing space, but it is time for our second break of the podcast. When we come back, we will be talking about writing real people into historical fiction, in this case, Eleanor Roosevelt. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Eva Shaw. Well, how about characters that are, um, you're writing historical fiction, so often we encounter real characters, but you get to fictionalize them a little bit. Uh, the one I, that pops to mind, especially for your book, is Eleanor Roosevelt. So can you talk a little bit about writing real people into historical fiction? Well, I, I took a, a literary license to do that, but I do um have catch the reader's interest in what, what was happening, what kind of current events, what kind of tempo there was in America at that, that time. What fun to add Eleanor Roosevelt. I have always admired her and, and strength and her ability to overcome a lot of odds that she was faced slandering husband that we Americans didn't know about. And I like the became human to me instead of just reading the biographies and material about. And I enjoyed that so much in the book. And I uh, using her was fun. And I did quite a bit of research on that to make her character sound true. I and I've done that with some other characters and in the new book I'm working on a couple historical figures as well. Yeah, it sounds like a, a lot of fun to just take somebody that you, you know, you only know on paper and kind of bring them to life a little bit. Yeah. yeah. What about historical fiction do you think um, draws you to writing in the genre? Well, as I said, I really have always loved fiction. I grew up in California and California history is amazing. American history is amazing. And the challenges that were put in front of people and yet survived. Uh, I I believe I, in, it was um, John Stein uh, in his book, Travels with Charlie, which is my favorite road trip book. And he talked about Americans being um, travelers and take chances. And I really believe that because my I'm, I'm second generation American, grandparents on both sides immigrated through New York, some legally and some not me, uh, back in the early 1800 or 1900s. Me. And they were entrepreneurs. They were optimists. They knew that there'd be something wonderful if they can put out the hard work to get here. And so their lives have been fascinating to me. And I think that's where I caught the historical I wanted to know more about um, their lives, families' lives. And unfortunately, my parents passed away. I was in my 20s, so I never really had a chance to ask them a question about their parents. Who was, um, I'm a second-generation immigrant, and um, they, some didn't, but they all came to America for the opportunity. And I think that's... What I like to write about in my characters is their ground a bit and then how they're seeking to have a better life as we still 
try to do. And so because I didn't get a chance history of my parents, because at 20 something, I was just too naive to ask. Um, I sought it out myself. Of course, it's not them talking, but I can read books about them. I can read books about um, how it was when my grandmother from Northern uh, Europe and the other one from Romania came to America without English. And um, a couple of the grandparents, of course, never learned English because they stayed in the area, a ghetto, um, and could speak the native language. But all opportunities, and, and I'm thrilled to be part of that background. And so it made me long to know more about history and more history about our country. Fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have similar experiences just wanting you know to know more about my my ancestors and where they came from. And I think it can lead to a lot of interesting research. Absolutely. And I love that PBS show, Finding Your Roots. Someday when I'm yeah, really me too. famous, maybe they'll ask me on there and I'll be yeah. horrified in front of America. <laughs> <laughs> or you could find out something really cool. Yes. I, I think I should ask them if I can be on there. Never there you go. Never hurts to ask. Um, right. Before we uh, started recording, you were talking about the fact that you're currently writing the sequel or editing the sequel to The Seer. So can you talk a little bit about that without, of course, giving too much away? Oh, I would love to. Well, it is four years later. The war is over. Beatrix has decided to move back to Santa Barbara where she grew up. She had a very well childhood because her parents were killed when she was young. So she was shuffled around to schools and so on. And she, I uh, grew up in Santa Barbara, so I know the people say, ooh, Santa Barbara, Oprah, real. my dad worked in a gas station. You know, they're the flip side of the rich of Santa Barbara. And um, it was a great city to up in as a kid. And I hope to bring that flavor of California and Santa Barbara to the new book. Of course, Thomas is in the new book. And God bless him. I love him. He's such a scientist, so pragmatic. And yet he goes flying off with these and doesn't even know he has. And they both get themselves in. And it's a little darker, the new book, in places. Um, for the longest time, I had the three bodies in the city morgue that I did not know what to do with Sarah. <laughs> so, oh my goodness, not four bodies? <laughs> Yeah, three bodies in the morgue, and I didn't know what to do. And so I finally figured it out, and it all came together. And the end is a little grislier than I anticipated, but I think it's appropriate to the book. And um, I'm enjoying it. I'm giving it to three trusted friends, now my beta readers, and they get to read it where with all the typos and mistakes and things, you know, goes to a copy editor and then the publisher. So I'm hoping that it'll be out in September. Um, it depends how long it takes me with my editing process. <laughs> right, right. Do we get to find out any more about Beatrix's biological parents in this book? Absolutely. And uh, that is pretty much settled by the end of the seer. Uh, if the doors are open for more. And I have just actually thinking about that today, how I want to bring a couple of those characters from the first book, Seer, back, if in fact I write the third in the series. But I like her a lot. Um, she's more mature. Um, Thomas had returns to uh, during the war and makes it back safely because he is a scientist. And um, then, you know, they've been apart for four years and uh, they've changed a bit. So that's interesting to write the dynamics of the characters as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned previously that you have been writing forever, wanted to write forever. Um, what, what forever was... and ever, yes. <laughs> Apparently that's the 80s you mentioned, forever is the 80s. <laughs> forever, yes. Back the old days was the 80s, yes. But... Uh, Got, I think it was about 30 when I really got tired of telling people that I wanted to be a writer. I grew up and I decided to put on my big girl panties and do what a writer does 
write. And I studied writing and I read uh, the authors that I admired. And um, as I be in English and business, the business part was good because I knew how to um, compose letters. I might have pretty good uh, command of English, English is silly language. And um, so uh, that part and keeping records, pretty easy for me. Um, and even the rejection was not that I early on, yes, I spent time sitting at my kitchen table crying when I got a rejection look in the old days. And um, I remember the first time I got an acceptance, um, an article, and I was paid $54 for my first article. So excited, I couldn't stop screaming. And um, my youngest rushed into the house, he was a kid at the time, thinking I'd probably chopped off my hand. <laughs> I was just did he get a $54 check? I bought a dictionary. And like I said, it was a long time ago, the 80s. Um, you wild I woman, you, and you're buying your dictionary. I paid the gas and electric bill with the rest of it. <laughs> I love it. It's time for our final break of the podcast, but can I just say that I do love when authors make me giggle? It is one of my favorite things. <laughs> when we come back, Eva will be giving her advice for aspiring authors, so stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Eva Shaw. Um, do you have advice then for aspiring authors? Absolutely. Uh, it is to write. Put your backside to the chair and write. Carve out time every day to write. Make it a priority. We would never, at least I wouldn't, um, skip a hairdresser appointment. I love my hairdresser and um, I wouldn't with my dentist or my attorney make writing that priority important. And it isn't for everybody, Sarah, not, and I'm delighted because that cuts down on that. Not everybody wants to be a writer, but if it's important, then carve out time to write, barter, blackmail, do whatever you have to do to get time for yourself, blackmail, maybe but barter and um, <laughs> uh, read in your genre, which genre is just a fancy word for a category. There are categories of fiction and nonfiction. For instance, mystery fiction is one genre. Uh, read books of people you admire, but don't just read them for pleasure. Read them for pleasure, yes, but and study how characters are developed, how dialogue is used, how chapters are in up, how um, description comes across, especially mystery fiction, the location is almost, well, maybe is another character in the book. For instance, the seer could not have been written New York or Pittsburgh or Miami. It had, because of this, had to be in New Orleans. And so it get to, it has that bit strong influence. No, and it's not plagiarism. You're not going to be copying this, but you'll be you take that information and it's instill it in your own writing. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned um, reading for reading within your genre, but also reading for pleasure, which those are not mutually exclusive. But when you read for pleasure, what authors and genres do you gravitate toward? Oh, I I love and I am a groupie. I have to say, I'm not going to stalk her. Absolutely, totally admire Louise Penny. She's a Canadian uh, mystery writer. She's the gold standard. And if I was going to have some my work uh, that she would be the person. Her books are more why done it, which I like the psychological um, fact that characters, really the evil ones act out of their own uh, reasons and why do they do that and how do they do that? And she's, she's a master at that. I am right, I'm a reader. And if you haven't read the last thing he told me, wow. That, and right now I'm reading um, Ann Patchett's uh, essays and she say about how Snoopy, the Charles Schultz character, taught her everything about writing, which is fun art. And I like to read a variety of um, genres. This, of course, are my favorite. Anne Cleves is an excellent writer. And I'm going to the new... Um, can't uh, um, it's called the French Braid. Tyler is the uh, author. I'm reading that next. So I think, as I mentioned before we came on the air, it really bothers me that it takes an author like a year to write a book. It takes me three days to read it. I mean, how rude! It takes them a year to finish a book. <laughs> so. And I can't slow myself down. I know. I get it. They should. What about us? What about our needs? <laughs> um, actually, you were talking about Louise Penny, which reminded me that I need to. I've only read the first one, so I, I went and added, looked up the second one and added it to my uh, my wish list. My to be my TBR. Oh, good. I need to read more because I, I agree. I like her a lot. She really um, is an excellent writer, and the way she describes. Yeah, and the characters, and even the food. Oh my gosh, it's marvelous. Yes, yes. Her first book She's takes so place around food. around Thanksgiving, which of course is in October for Canada, but still Thanksgiving. And the the talk about all the food is just amazing. Absolutely, yeah. And and I love read new authors, and um, it's there's just so good books to read these days. And I'm always I I, I try to person, but I never skimp on buying books, which is one of my, so as writers, we need to buy books. And I understand if you go to the library and you need pennies, but uh, we need to support our industry. And I constantly do that by buying books. We want an industry that's out there when our books are ready. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so I know you have a website. So if you can share your website address as well as anywhere else people can find you sure. on the internet. Uh, sure. Um, my uh, It's evashaw.com. And the supermodel or the famous DJ, there are others, but I have the name first. <laughs> yes. So uh, as I mentioned before we came on the air that I had actually somebody think I was the supermodel. And of course, yes, I am. <laughs> but it's not true. You could be. Uh, Own it. <laughs> <laughs> I told them. And uh, I have a YouTube video, Eva Shaw's Write Your Book in Minutes, which explains the famous bubble method, which is drop dead easy if you're looking, easy outlining method, Eva Shaw's Write Your Book in 20 Minutes. Um, I have a lot of blog entries, uh, everything you need to know about writing on my web. And I also teach writing through Education to Go. And you on Facebook and see pictures of me and my family and silliness and all of that kind of. Perfect. And then um, one more thing I want to bring up. We talked about it a little bit earlier and you write about it in the beginning of the year. Can you talk about the proceeds going to um, oh. I just blanked on the name, Days for Girls? Can you talk a little bit Days, about that? Thank you. Days for Girls International. I advise, invite your listeners to check it out. It truly is a bare bones organization 
I've known them since the very beginning. They do not waste any money on anything. They provide sanitary products for girls and women throughout the world in the worst situations. And I was horrified myself when, and again, this was years back in the 80s, um, when I first thought about well, what do girls do if they're having their period and there's no products. And I, I think I was having PMS at the, and <laughs> I was angry at the world. And I realized, and I learned that in the room, they have to stay in the hut. They can't go out. They can't go to school, which means they need an education. They can't work to provide for their families uh, that join the community because they are having their period. And this is not a issue. This is a humanitarian issue. These girls and women are being punished because of something that's so biological. I mean, none of us would be here otherwise. And uh, Days for Girls is changing that by, by, by bringing free products to women and around the world. And the proceeds of the SEER Every time somebody buys a book, 50% when I started this, and now I've decided to give all of the proceeds of the SEER to Days for Girls, because I personally, you know, my, I'm, I'm putting my money where my mouth is, I guess, and I invite readers to check it out. And uh, it's a very worthwhile organization and, and something that we can kind of, as, as humanitarians, as people who believe in equal rights, we can help in the world through this. Yes, thank you so much for um, sharing that information, but also bringing light to it. I really appreciate that. It's been my and also yeah, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. And we had some technical issues, but thanks for hanging in there with me. I really appreciate yeah, well, it. You're, you're quite welcome. Thank you once again to Eva for joining me to talk about the book, The Seer, uh, also for putting up with the technical difficulties that we had and being patient and having a sense of humor about all of it. Um, I really appreciate all of that. She said something, I think, towards the beginning of the interview about history is like gossip. <laughs> you get all the good stories and, you know, you kind of delve into people's lives. And uh, that really resonated with me because people would often ask me why I was a history major. And, you know, they would talk about, well, a lot of people don't like history. They think it's boring. But um, I was never really into some of the history that I was learning in terms of politics and wars and which leader did this and which leader did that. And of course, that's all very important. And it all plays into history. Um, but for me, it was always the people. It was always the the regular people, the, the, the social history, the personal history, finding out about people's lives and learning history just through the everyday lives of the people who lived during those times. And I think that's why I'm drawn so much to historical fiction. And it really does feel a little bit like gossip sometimes when you are talking about history or historical fiction. And because you're, 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 you're peeking into people's lives, whether they existed or not, you're peeking into those lives, right? And so I, 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 I liked that. And it, um, it made me smile. And it's, a, it's kind of a good way of looking at history and historical fiction. So thank you to Eva for joining me and for giving me that little nugget, something to think about in terms of history and historical fiction. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners. You know, I appreciate you so very much. If you are a fan of this podcast, uh, it would be wonderful if you would like, subscribe, etc., wherever you listen to the podcast so that you can get new episodes as soon as they come out. Please also, um, if you haven't done so already, leave a review, written or starred. Either way, helps us get this podcast out to more book lovers such as yourselves. And if you're not following on social media, you can do so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And I would love to hear from you. I love to interact with listeners on social media. So hit me up. Tell me what you've been reading. Um, tell me what's, what's on your probably never ending TBR lists. Uh, yeah, I love to hear from listeners. So I also hope that you will join me next time when I will be speaking with author VK Trishler about her book, The Revenge Seeker. It is the second in a series. It is fantasy, young adult. So I'm looking forward to talking to her about that. And I hope that you will join me. Hope you're having um, a really good week and that whatever your week involves, um, it involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. 
Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Move to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Music.